Um, the focus of this really is ransomware. So I want to talk about these programs, malicious programs, that are trying to extort money from us. So if you hunt around for definitions of ransomware, it's difficult to get a definition that captures every aspect of this threat. And there are broadly two kinds of ransomware. Uh, the first are what we call blockers. Uh, blockers, as the name suggests, stops you getting access to the device. And on the whole, they try to scare you into um, thinking that you've done something that's broken a local law, and therefore you're going to have to pay a spot fine in order to get access to your computer restored. Um, the second kind are cryptos. And again, as the name suggests, they will take your data, they will encrypt it, and again, they will make you pay money in order to get access back to that data. Um, the first kinds of ransomware actually were cryptos. Um, around about 2006, 2007, um, they were largely kind of developed within the Russian Federation and targeted people within the Russian Federation, but they did start to spread out of that after a couple of years. And things took a dip and they disappeared off the scene around about <coughs> 2009. And then they came back about two or three years ago. Um, and the bulk of them were blockers, um, largely because that's easy to do. Um, it, you know, it doesn't require that much know-how in order to um, stop a non-technical individual from getting access to their system, to the start button, to the file system, and so on. Um, but the situation we're in now, um, most uh, attacks are cryptos. Um, so, on the whole, these, these are going to be quite uh, technically well implemented. Um, they will encrypt, encrypt the data effectively. Um, you won't get it back until you pay them some money. So it, it is just plain and simple extortion. Hence my title, Stand and Deliver, because it's a modern form of, of the highwayman. That's, that's what they're doing. Um, so some numbers. Well, it is a growing problem. Um, at the end of 2015, when we looked back and did our retrospective, there were about three quarters of a million um, attacks that we had blocked. So just to quantify what that means, that is computers protected by Kaspersky Lab products where an attempt to infect the computer had taken place and we blocked it. Now clearly there are a lot more machines which are not running Kaspersky Lab software. And on top of that, not everybody who is running our software opts in to be part of our Kaspersky security network, our cloud-based infrastructure, which is gathering all of this anonymized data. So it grossly underestimates what the problem is. But the point is that year on year, we're using the same yardstick to measure. So we're getting at least an idea of the scale and the direction of travel, if not specific concrete numbers. Um, so you can see that the bulk of them in 2015 even were blockers, but that has switched round actually, and, and the bulk of them now are, are cryptos. I can tell you that in quarter two, 2016 alone, we blocked about a third of a million cryptos. So just in that quarter, we saw about half of the amount we'd seen in, in 2015. And one of our predictions about 12 months ago was that this would reach the same proportions as banking malware does now. Stuff designed to capture banking credentials and steal money from it. So we're well on the way to that. Um, I will say also that the numbers underestimate the problem for a different reason. Um, most internet security products today are not dependent on the use of signatures for finding malware. Probably about 60% of our detections are using some other proactive technology. Either um, we are sandboxing, or we're using heuristics, or we're tracking the behavior of applications on the system. Um, we're correlating information between personal firewall and um, our antivirus, and, and so on. So a lot, a lot of stuff, the bulk of it is blocked proactively. This data, on the other hand, comes just from signature 
uh, detections where we've identified it with a specific name. So again, another reason why that underestimates what the scale of the problem is. Um, about 20% of these infections um, target the corporate community. So they're focused on businesses. They are the victims. Um, and 17% of them um, are targeted at Android. So we've seen a, a, an increase in, in the volume of, um, of Android infections. So that, that's pretty much 20% business, 17% focus on Android. Um, so this is cross-platform for sure. Um, now, I, I will say one other point while we're talking um, about the general issue of ransomware, and that is it bucks the trend of malware. So if you look over the last 10 or 12 or 13 years, since malware for profit dominated the threat landscape, the aim really has, to been, has been to fly under the radar. So if you want to make money, it's in your interest as a cyber criminal that your victim doesn't notice what's going on. And so the focus is definitely on being unobtrusive, not impacting the performance of the system in any way, and not being detected. Persistence is really important. Um, this bucks the trend because it's very in your face. From the moment you get infected, practically, you get a ransom demand of trust in your face. Um, and, and so. Um, what, it, what it loses, I suppose, in unobtrusiveness, it's gaining in direct monetization. Um, if we look at the geography, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not really interested in the specifics here, because if I were to give you a breakdown of, of mobile malware types, or PC malware types, or Mac malware, then we would get meaningful information back. If I actually show you the, the statistics for this, they come out at sort of 5% at the top of that. By the time we get down to the bottom or the second half of that table, it's 1% or 0.7% or 0.6%. In other words, actually, others vastly outnumbers any specific country. So it's very flat and it is a worldwide phenomenon and it impacts many, many countries. And that's why there's not really any standout sector in the globe that is um, on the, on bearing the brunt of this. It, it affects all of us in, in all countries. Um, so blockers. Um, I've put up a couple of examples here and these are all um, mobile blockers. Uh, but they give you a flavor of how they, the, the particular malware works in general. Um, so you, you stop getting access to, to the system, you get a message on the screen, um, and it doesn't matter what language it is, it broadly is going to say the same thing. Um, some of them will actually put up a specific message in the language of the victim and using or masquerading as the law enforcement agency of that country as well. Uh, so not surprisingly, they take the same approach. So whether it's Russian or English, they say you've been accessing some illegal content Sometimes they get specific about what kind of content that is. And as a result, because you've broken a particular statute, you need to pay a spot fine. And you notice the one on the left there uh, has got that fuzzy area in the middle. It's designed to activate your camera on the smartphone and take a picture of you, the victim, to add credibility to the ransom demand. So they're pretending you are on the most wanted list effectively and the police know who you are. Well, they do, the, the, the malware does, because they're just taking a picture of you, that's all. So it's just to lend credibility to the attack. Um, the average ransom demand in terms of money is about $300. Um, but as all averages, you know, that, that really doesn't, doesn't tell you that much about a specific attack. It could run into thousands or even tens of thousands. It could be run into tens of dollars. It just depends. And I've got to tell you that sometimes the ransom demand that they're asking for will depend on who the victim is. So if they think you're from an organization and have more money than a regular individual, they'll try and squeeze more money from you. Um, if they think that maybe you are um, uh, non-technical, uh, and, and again, they can squeeze money from you, they'll go for that as well. So they do vary it. Um, so what about cryptos? Well, cryptos, as I've said, are slightly different because they're not just 
blocking access while everything remains intact behind their screen, they're actually encrypting your data. So it could be personal photos, it could be PowerPoint files, it could be spreadsheets, it, it could be project files, it could be anything or everything. In fact, they tend to have a very, very wide list. And just to hone in on the ransom demand there, um, there are a couple of points I want to pick out. Um, the first is, A, it's in your face. Another is um, that they typically will have a button which lets you decrypt one of your files. So they want to prove two things. One, we've actually encrypted the data. And two, we'll, we will give you it back if you pay up. Often now what we're seeing is a countdown mechanism and every day that passes, the ransom demand will go up. And then they get to a point at which they say, well, you're not going to pay up, so you're not having the data back. We're not going to decrypt it anymore. And they're trying to put the squeeze on you and getting you to pay A as soon as possible and also hanging over you, you have this sort of Damocles in the form of you know, losing the data altogether. Um, they will use whatever payment mechanism is going to work for them. Um, increasingly we're seeing Bitcoin used, but it could be some other kind of electronic payment, Ucash or, or something else like that. Um, a, because it's easy to set up. B, because uh, it's pretty anonymous. So it's easy for them to hide between the cracks, if you like, on the internet. Um, so moving into a, a case study, and Tor Locker um, is, is, is the one that I want to, uh, to focus on here. Um, several features I'll draw it as we go. One of them is if you kind of make a, an attempt to remove the software, um, it will display a message uh, to the effect that, well, actually, you, you need to, um, to download it again and do a reinstall if you want to get your, your data back. Um, so the last thing they want you to do is to, is to remove it, but unless you're doing a clean remove through your anti-malware solution, probably you're going to end up with a situation, if you do it manually, where you, you, you get this message um, saying, well, look, you've, you've tried to remove it, better put it back on, and here's the download link to do it, otherwise you'll lose your data. Um, in the way, in terms of it, if its infection, I mean, typically these things will come encrypted anyway when they land on your computer. So they will decrypt their own data section, which has all of the, the information they're going to use to do the encryption of your files. Um, and the other thing is that, like a lot of malware, they will A, try to gain persistence on the system, so they'll modify the registry so that when you restart the computer, it's loaded automatically and it's in control. They will also often try to um, remove aspects of the operating system that would let you hunt down what's going on. So stopping Task Manager, for example, stopping RegEdit. So they, they don't want you to have tools which look at what's going on. But actually, if they've implemented the encryption properly, then it's not going to help you anyway, actually. Um, this one's interesting too, deleting system recovery points. They don't want you to easily be able to get back to the last known good load with all your data there. So they're going to try and get round or disable all of these um, aspects of the operating system that might let you recover. Um, in terms of the, the encryption, well, it will go after multiple drives. It will go after effectively anything that is connected to that computer. And we've seen a, a development over the, the years um, in several aspects. One is the, they make less mistakes than they used to. In the early days, uh, 10 years ago, it was typical that we could not only uh, remove uh, cryptos from the system, but we could also decrypt the data. That has become less and less common because they're making less mistakes now. So there are two things we rely on if we want to be able to um, reverse the encryption process. One is that they have implemented their encryption algorithm wrongly. They've made a mistake. Uh, the second is that we are able to work with police agencies to get access to the command and control servers of the criminals and therefore get access to the keys that they're using to do the decryption. Um, 
Now, I mean, the, the algorithm that they're using will vary. In this case, they're using uh, RSA keys. Um, um, and they're, they're, they're going to implement one of 128 um, of these, depending on various circumstances. But they're trying to vary it effectively, is what I'm saying here. Um, they're not using a single key for every infection, which is obviously important because as researchers, we could get ourselves infected and then look at the, the key that they're using, get that from the system and use it to decrypt the data on every other um, infected computer. But we can't do that because they, they will typically now use a different key for every infection. Um, the way it basically operates is they, they add uh, some padding files, they add their ID to this, um, and then they actually add the, um, the, the, the key they're going to use. And then they encrypt all of the file content. Um, and in the case of this one, they assume a particular size of file as the maximum. Um, obviously, if they come across a file that exceeds that, then they're going to make certain assumptions about that file, and obviously there's a potential risk to the data um, if it's a non-standard file, if it exceeds what their limit has been set, and that's purely arbitrary. Um, if you're interested in more details on Torwalker specifically, uh, you can go to securelist.com, which is where we tend to put all of our technical research, and just do a search for it, and you get a full expose on this particular uh, piece of malware. Um, the issue of keys and, and key lengths and so on crops up, and I, I've taken the, the 256 bit key, which is used by Tor Locker, and just dug into it a little bit. Um, I'm not going to go through each of these. The, the point here is that, um, given computing standards that we have today in terms of processing power and time available, if they implement their encryption properly, then you're not going to be able to work around it. That, that's basically it. It's, it's bye bye to your data unless you pay the ransom. And the ransom demand for Tor Locker, typical of many, many ransomware programs, very in your face, very dramatic, um, and uh, this is exactly on the average, $300. Uh, and like a lot of software, they just put the same amount into different currencies. So it's $300, 300 euros, 300 pounds, um, Canadian dollars, whatever it is. And as I say, very, very dramatic. They want you to know what's happened and they want to scare you into paying the money. So what happens when you, you pay it? Well, you, you click on their link, you put in your details, um, and, and essentially, once they've got the, the ransom payment and they know they've been able to cash out, so to speak, then they will take the key from their uh, C2 server, command and control server, and, um, and use that basically to, to decrypt all of the files that they've encrypted on your computer. Um, some of these, including Tor Locker, will have affiliate programs and they will go through various levels. So, um, you know, you, you can, uh, they, they will offer different functionality depending on how much somebody wants to pay as an affiliate. And this underlines a, a point about malware generally, which is that underlying malware now, um, we have a fully developed marketplace. Um, the vast, vast majority of attacks are designed to make money illegally. The vast, vast majority. Um, so, you know, we have people who are specialists in writing code. We have people who manage networks, so-called botnets of compromised computers. We have people who um, want to deliver spam. We have people who will steal email addresses to put into the hands of the spammers so they can do what they want to do. We have value-add resellers who maintain websites that connect up botnet owners with people who want to distribute spam or collect identity information. Um, there's a fully developed marketplace and it, it runs into affiliate programs as well where people will distribute malware on somebody else's behalf and they get a kickback. There's a unique identifier goes into the malware and they get a kickback for the ones that they have actually installed. Um, and that's true also for ransomware as it is for other types of malware. 
So what about the trends that we're seeing? Because it has grown in sophistication. Um, not only are they more difficult to decrypt, sometimes impossible to decrypt, but we're seeing other trends as well. So multiple um, forms of encryption being used um, by the same ransomware, for example. We're seeing script-based malware, which obviously makes it easier for the attackers to port from one platform to another, and also to customize for things like affiliate programs. Um, we're seeing a diversification in terms of platform, so Mac ransomware, Linux ransomware. We're seeing server-only ransomware too, um, where, where the attackers are very, very clearly going after organizations rather than individuals. So maybe even three years ago, this would have fallen exclusively into the category of random speculative attack where the attackers didn't know who we were, they didn't care who we were, um, as long as they hit enough people and could rake in enough money, they were quite happy. But over the last two years in particular, we've started to see a merge of targeted attack tactics with ransomware. So the aim is to get money, but they're focusing it in different places. Um, so after a few hospitals started to fall victim and paid the ransom, then we started to see more attacks on hospitals. Um, and, and by the way, it's worth pointing out that normally speaking, these people will decrypt the data. And it is by and large in their interest to do so because if you get scammed and you pay the ransom and they don't give you your data back, then in six months' time, if you fall victim to them again, you're not going to pay it because you've got no confidence that you'll get the data back even if you pay. So generally they do, but it's not worth assuming that because these are, after all, criminals. Um, the Kentucky Heart Hospital um, about a year ago get hit with ransomware. They paid the ransom and the criminals behind the attack decrypted a chunk of data and presented that back to the victims and said, but if you want the rest of it, you need to pay some more money. So they did what a lot of extortions do. They, they up the ante. They didn't pay, by the way. Um, but the thing to remember, of course, is every time somebody pays the ransom, it validates their business model. And that's why we've seen an increase in ransomware over the years because people are thinking that's a profitable area to go into. And again, this is just standard economics. Capital flows into an area that's going to be productive. It's no different just because it's criminal activity. Um, they will do whatever they can to try and cover their tracks. So encrypted communication between compromised endpoint and servers. They will locate their servers within the Tor network in order, often anyway, in order to make our job difficult of trying to sinkhole their, um, their networks um, and also to make the job of law enforcement agencies harder. Now that's not to say there aren't successes. We worked with the Dutch National High Tech Crime Unit about a year ago to um, basically get to the bottom of the, the coin vault uh, group and um, the police made arrests we were able to get hold of the servers they were using for decrypting the data, get the keys from it, and make them available so that any, any victims of that could go and decrypt their data. Um, and it's the only plug I'm going to make. Um, moving on from that, we, we've widened the scope of that, working with um, Intel Security, working with Europol, working with the National High Tech Crime Unit in, in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, so it's a joint venture. We've created a, a site called um, No More Ransom. And um, we basically are, are feeding keys that we have onto that site so that people can decrypt their data. And I did some checking on this, and the figures, it's roughly about 30% of ransomware that we're able to decrypt at this stage. So it's, it's quite high, but obviously two-thirds of it we can't. But I, I would say if ever you fall victim to ransomware, um, don't just assume you're not going to get the data back. It's always worth contacting your vendor to see whether they can help. Um, you know, get, get that data back and they can do some checking at their end. Um, so it may not be possible, but always worth checking. Um, 
again, bit message. This is talking here about communication between the criminals to try to make it harder to apprehend them. Um, and, and finally on, on this, we've seen over the last 12 months several pieces of ransomware that don't just work on uh, work through Windows once the system is booted. They will actually infect at a sector level. So they will put their code on the master boot record, the first physical sector on the disk, and they will store a copy of that further along the first track. Um, and then they will do the decryption by manipulating the file table. Um, so A, they get in first, making it harder to um, find out what's going on, but also they get to kind of implement their activity a lot sooner. So they've diversified, they've got more technical, um, they're more organized for sure. So that takes us on to the issue of, well, what do we do about it? And I've put this, how not to deal with the problem. Um, actually, the FBI has changed its position on this. Um, this is about 18 months ago, an FBI guy at a, a conference in Boston who said, well, to be honest, we often advise people just to pay the ransom. And I'm not saying that's always bad advice, but I wouldn't go public with that advice. Um, you know, there may be situations where people do have no choice, and that's critical data. And you know what? You've got no choice but to take, take the, uh, the gamble. But it's not a good policy decision. And generally, the, the FBI's advice, just like the National Crime Agency here, an action fraud would be, do not pay the ransom. Because you validate their business model, you may not get the data back. So what do we do? Well, there's technology to help with this. Yes, we can, we can go for the known identification. We can do it on the basis of heuristics. So does this code look dodgy? Um, we can do it by watching the system, looking at the behavior, even to the point at which, if it starts to encrypt data, we can block it and then roll back. So what we will do is we will take, a, take backup copies when we notice that, that behavior so we can restore pretty much all of that data. Um, and then other things you know, that, that you can do in terms of just management processes. You're not giving people automatic admin rights on a computer. Because that way, if in an organization one person gets um, in infected on the system, if they don't have admin rights to that system, nor does the malware. Um, segmenting the network. Again, so that if I get infected and I can't access HR or the accounts part of the network, nor can the malware. So you can stop the, limit the spread of it. Um, I mean, the same obviously goes for patching, the same goes for rolling out internet security software, but backup is critical. Um, with this type of malware in particular, if you have a backup, then you're not going to be in a position where you have to pay the ransom. But you've got to be a bit careful. If, it's, if you just keep a, a USB storage device connected permanently to the computer, the data on that will be encrypted automatically too. And some of them, by the way, will automatically encrypt data on connected network drives too. So if you take a backup, make sure it's a backup that's kept offline. Uh, cloud backup too, but again, be careful. If you have access to your cloud storage, so does the malware on your computer. Um, and we're back to education, so you know this takes us back to something that was mentioned earlier in the day. Um, education is an interesting topic. Um, you know, many organisations I know will will have a very well thought out um, policy for their staff, for their employees, for students in the case of the university about what people must do or must not do, um, and. That's a, it's a very thorough policy document that make people sign off on it, often in their first week in the organization. Um, and therein lies a the problem, because you know, when you start at an organization, what do you want to know in the first week? Where to get a sandwich? Where can I eat? Where are the bathrooms? How the heck do I remember everybody's name? Security is not toppermost in your mind. So if that's all an organization does, we're not going to get very far. Now, I'm from a generation where we were drip-fed road safety campaigns, where you know we were drip-fed clunk-click every trip in the car. Um, and changing the law on seatbelts didn't make everybody wear a seatbelt overnight. It was drip, drip, drip of public information 
over, over years which did that. And I think we've got to take the same approach with education. Security ultimately um, is a cultural thing and it needs to be built into organisations. And, and education, if anything, has to aim at changing the culture. And there are different ways to do it. So, um, <coughs> helping people to help themselves is always a good one. If you teach me how to secure my wireless router at home, and what the dangers are, and what do I do to lock it down, then I'm well on the way to understanding why the organization recommends that I don't connect to a public Wi-Fi to do confidential transactions, for example. So getting people on board with their self-interest is good. Getting imaginative with people, you know, whether that's comic strips, posters, um, or, or, or videos, or screensavers, it, it, it's all, all good. Um, and by imaginative, we go the whole hog. If you think about, you pick your top five um, security tips for staff and post them on walls. I mean, put them on the cubicles of bathrooms. You've got a captive audience. I mean, we stand at bus stops and what do we do? We look at posters because we've got nothing else to do. Same with train stations. So hit the points in the organization where people are doing other things and they're bored waiting for the microwave to churn out their lunch, read the poster. And if you keep it down to five, then you've got a good chance that people will remember it. Above that, people start to lose it. Um, and I'm gonna finish with the last education point. I was at a conference focused on this aspect of the human um, elements of security. And there was a lady, nothing to do with cyber security at all. She was to do with health and security from a big organization in the UK. Um, but she was tasked with the idea of getting health and safety information out. And one of the things she said that stuck in my head was, um, she had buy-in from senior management, which was very, very important. But what she used to do was to stop people and say, what are the top five health and safety tips? Give me them now. And people would bluster, I don't know, and say, well, why don't you know? It's like, oh, well, we haven't done that in our department. So you end up the manager and say, why don't your staff know the top five tips? At which point the manager might go to senior management and say, why am I getting carpeted for this? And it's like, well, because it's important. At which point you make sure you do. And she said she was really, really unpopular. But after about six months, when she stopped somebody, they came out with the top five. They just knew them. So ultimately, it is about culture and it's about getting imaginative in how we try and change that culture. So I hope that's been useful. Um, thank you for your attention and uh, I think we've got time for questions if, if there are any.